Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to our latest edition of the webinar series of 2024, brought to you in collaboration between HVS, Bird and Bird, Alex Partners, and EP. You're very welcome. I think it's fair to say that 2024 has been a year of many ups and downs, and many of now have concerned eyes. They look forward to 2025. The recent budget has felt like another blow to many operators, especially those who are working with small margins. April, we see the rise in NI contributions, as well as rates, which will hurt many. And the hope, of course, is that the consumer will continue to spend. Much does seem to sit with the consumer wanting to go out and face and have new experiences, which does make the whole framework feel quite fragile. Of course, the counter argument is that this is a bitter pill to swallow now for stronger growth to come, and that the overall picture will improve. So we look, we look forward to hearing from our panel of experts, all our experts today, with their insights. However, whichever way you look at it, though, it's been a very challenging eight year period for the industry when one considers how the industry has had to face the fallout from Brexit to the COVID challenge to the cost of living crisis, high inflation, new taxes, and of course, how Trump too may or may not impact. And the odds are we're going to have faced a decade of unique challenges. One of my favorite quotes of the year has been, growth is projected to hold steady amid weakening prospects and rising threats. The world needs a shift in policy gear. There are opportunities, threats, threats and risks all around us. At the same time, the industry has seen a wave of new regulation come into effect, some of it with positive intent. The new tipping legislation is causing extra work, but also brings stronger transparency and trust to the approach. There will naturally be views on all sides of the argument. And again, today, we hope we can bring real insight into, into what our experts think and what the arguments really are. The one truth I think we all are becoming increasingly accustomed to is that we face more regular and faster rated challenges and change. And no doubt there'll be more to come, both good and bad. We therefore look forward to hearing from Kate Nichols, the Chief Executive of UK Hospitality, which works closely with government on her views and thoughts. We will then hear from Rachel Farrington, Head of Tourism Affairs at Visit Britain. Tourism plays and is set to play an ever, ever increasingly important role. So we look forward to hearing from Rachel. And then finally, we look forward to Russell Kett, Chairman of HVS London, the expert panel of, of experts in discussion on these issues. So welcome to all our speakers, and we look forward to hearing your thought. Please, at any time, feel free to ask questions while the, obviously the button's at the bottom. We will endeavour to try and answer all the questions during the session, or at worst, after the session, but we will come back to you, the rest assured. Finally, before we begin, let's just take a sounding on some of the perspectives and thoughts through a number of poll questions, if that's okay. So Izzy, can we just share the poll questions? Now, I do need you to ask just to scroll down so you can read all the, all the questions as we go. Question one, on balance with regard to the anticipated impact of the, on, the, on the UK hotel sector, was the recent budget more generous in the sector than you had expected? Broadly in line with what you expected? Not as damaging as you might have expected? Or so damaging that you're going out of business, selling up or emigrating? Question two. Which of these measures will have them have the most adverse impact on your business? The lowering of employers NI thresholds, the raising of employers NI percentages, reduction in business rates relief, rise in minimum wage, no reintroduction of VAT rebate for overseas tourists, or something else. And finally, do you expect the profitability of your business in 2025 to increase by more than 10%? increased by more than 5%, stay about the same as in 2024, decreased by more than 5%, or decreased by more than 10%. I look forward to seeing the results. Just give me a minute, a few seconds for everyone to answer. Izzy, can you show us the results as they come through? I think we probably expected broadly in line, we expected 77%, that's interesting. 
question two, 40% we're seeing the raising of NI percentages obviously being the, the most adverse effect. I think again, we probably, I think that's probably in line with most people's thoughts. And then point three, do you expect profitability is really quite evenly split, but stay about the same as in 2024, 29%. It seems to be a more so steady will decrease by 5%. Very interesting. And in some ways, um, better than I expected. So I look forward to be interesting to see all the views today. So can we open the session? I have pl to open the session. I have the pleasure to welcome Kate Nichols to come and talk to us. So Kate, Kate, welcome. And I'll pass over to you and good luck. Thank you very much, Chris. And, and I think Chris and I were at an event yesterday and he, he, he said the same thing about sort of eight years worth of pain. I think I'm on the A to G of crises that the industry has navigated. Uh, austerity, Brexit, COVID, debt, energy, food price inflation um, and lack of growth. Uh, I, I, I'd like to stop at age and I'd like to find something that we can look forward to. With that in mind, um, I've been asked to give you a quick overview the first 150 days of the Labour government, and obviously that budget, uh, what it means for the sector, where we're looking at, uh, and the, to the, to the outlook for, for growth. Um, are we going to see any, I think is, is the key question. Um, so I, I'm gonna start counterintuitively with some of the positives and some of the things that might give us cause for optimism over that longer term period. Um, and then I'll turn to the negatives uh, and you can't get away from that budget and I'll talk through some of those. So that's the, the areas that, that I'm gonna cover in, in my short presentation to you. Um, so if we do look at the, the new Labour government um, and uh, the pros and cons, the big uncertainties, is it an opportunity, is it a threat? I think if we start with the pros, the first thing is we're back to politics as the new boring. Um, and that hasn't been the case since around 2016 uh, when we had the Brexit referendum. And actually arguably you could say slightly before that uh, when we had coalition government, that wasn't normal. You didn't have the same sense of certainty around uh, what was gonna be coming through. So this is the new boring. Uh, it's quite clearly marked up as a five to 10 year project, which is why it causes the frustration that it does to business um, in the short term, because we're all focused on the immediacy and, and the immediacy of survival in many cases in the hospitality sector. But this government is looking at five to 10 years. Uh, we're likely to therefore see certainty and stability being brought to bear on political and macroeconomic life and debate. It allows for some long-term planning, um, and it allows for a, a sense of, of reassurance back to the investor community in particular, um, that you can start to get some traction on some of the big issues that we can become less of a basket case that we have been seen as being before. And when you look at what is happening in the US, and in the EU, we are in that midpoint. And I think Keir Starmer's speech at the Guild or the Lord Mayor's speech on foreign policy, positioning ourselves in between those two extremes and in between the uncertainties that you've got going on in other major economies, you can see how that is going to be a key part of brand Britain uh, when the government is projecting itself forward. And it is clearly looking at two terms and despite all the travails that it's faced in the first hundred days, the, the odds are that it is still a two-term government. Secondly, that macroeconomic stability, uh, the rule of law coming back into play uh, and, and the sort of government by technocrats, let's not forget Keir Starmer is essentially a civil servant. You are looking at that stability and certainty and you have a plethora of strategies coming out of the government, which will give longer term certainty. So we are back to having an annual budget and it's going to be in the autumn. And that gives certainty and stability around ch key changes. Gov businesses don't like economic shocks. This budget was bad for a couple of those very big ones, which we can turn to. But the idea that you might have two or three times a year, some fiscal event that changes fundamentally what you're doing back to the stability of an annual budget. We will have an investment strategy and we are seeing FDI returning as, as we see uh, the, the UK being a bit more of a safe haven. There are some pros and cons around that. Uh, again, if you, you have those shocks coming through, that can be undermined. But the government is working very hard to present its case for being stable and certain. Um, we are seeing sovereign wealth fund, capital wealth, wealth reform changes unlocking that global reinvestment and you haven't had a flicker around the election or indeed the budget from that that sort of broader investment community despite all the challenges that we've seen 
There will also be a trade strategy. And as part of that, you are starting the process of renegotiation around Brexit. I don't think it will be a wholesale unpick, but you can see yesterday the Chancellor going and talking about some reforms being taken forward. And as part of that, they are looking at youth mobility, um, which will be key for, for, for our sector in particular, where you get youth movement, both from a tourism, travel, visitor, but also working holiday visas. And then finally, in that sort of strategy and strategizing, you have the industrial strategy, a big focus within there about people and place, uh, a very big focus on the foundation economy, which is what we're classified as. So you've got your eight high growth sectors, high productivity sectors that are in clusters around the UK, and then running throughout the industrial strategy, a key theme around the importance of place-based businesses uh, in the foundation economy, the places that people live, work and invest across the UK, uh, the ones that are not clustered but are enablers of growth, facilitators of growth in those high growth sectors, the ones that do the, the neighbourhood uh, jobs and investment and high streets. And underneath that, you will see a small business strategy and a high street strategy. So again, as I say, government with a long term economic plan these areas that they might look at and as part of the industrial strategy they talk about some big issues that business has wanted to get changed for some time grid connectivity infrastructure both transport and it um, cheap energy and, and lowering of business energy bills in particular and then the critical one being skills uh, and reform in the skills area around apprenticeship levy around business skills and vocational training and in-work training uh, but also sort of fit for purpose from a uh, sort of entry level school right the way through to 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 later on and again a big focus there on foundational skills transferable skills and a golden thread of hospitality running throughout that and for us in particular, very pleased to have confirmed that we will have a hospitality strategy, we will have a high street strategy, and we will have a visitor economy tourism strategy. So being able to take forward some of the big issues, the crunchy issues that we know we need to get right, that we haven't been able to get traction on because of all those crises that have knocked things off track. And the final point is, you've got a mission led government here. We can harness that if they stick to their missions. It's very difficult to know whether it's it's five missions, six missions, seven foundational strands. It does keep changing, but it does mean that you've got a very central focus on delivering. So although there might be some hollow laughter around this and there was much hollow laughter that came out around the budget, you know, the top priority of this government remains growth. The industrial strategy is one element of that plan to get growth moving, but it's not the only one. And they are returning to that gradually to be able to see what they can do to unlock growth. Um, but for underneath that, for, for the Department for Business, it's regeneration of the high street, it's 80% employment, it's opportunity for all, it's social mobility, it's all the spaces that our sector can play best in, does play best in, and that the government wants to work with us to support. So there's a lot that can be done, but as I say, you've got the pain of the budget that we've got to get over and got to get over first. So that said, then turning on to the cons, I mean, there's there's two big cons uh, really when we're looking at this. Yes, there's the budget and I'll come on to those measures, but the doom and gloom and the overdoing the doom and gloom that uh, started in August um, off the back of the riots and then the things can only get worse mantra that the Chancellor has, has really kept on um, over the course of the summer, that has had a really damaging impact and an immediate impact on consumer confidence and consumer spend and footfall. The minute Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves stood up in August and said, we've got a 22 billion pound black hole, the economy is in a worse shape than we thought, it's going to be difficult, we're going to have to make some tough choices. Guess what? Consumers stopped going out, they stopped spending both in high streets, hospitality and retail. We've seen it across the board, but we saw it immediately in the week that that weekend, um, we saw it across the tills uh, and we haven't seen it pick up since. So we've seen it bumping along, although we saw green shoots of growth, we saw positive return of consumer confidence on the back of the election. Um, bizarrely, got the, a lot of uh, consumers were waiting for that, felt that the change was happening, things were gonna get better. And then to be told they weren't, 
big problem uh, and we've seen growth bumping along at, at sort of below one percent like for like and when you think that uh, cost price inflation in the sector currently still running at around eight nine percent likely to get back up to 13 percent as it has been a real big challenge there where the demand is not coming through and the spend is not coming through at the same level as you need to cover those costs so we've had that squeeze in the middle um, for those those businesses and as Chris said at the start for those that are high volume low margin that's particularly challenging but you've clearly seen a suppressing of demand and although household income has been protected household taxes have been protected you've got higher living wage you've got wage settlements in the public sector you've got cuts in NIs for employees that went through earlier in the year and you can see positive signs from the Bank of England and on inflation it hasn't changed the dial as far as consumers are concerned. And part of that will be because of the budget. Because inevitably, when you look at what's happened in our sector and retail is the same, between us, we employ about 7 million people um, with the sort of second and third largest private sector employers. You factor in our supply chain, you're getting up close to, to, to sort of 9 million. Um, you've heard uh, squeals of pain from businesses in that sector about the impact of the budget. For hospitality, it's £3.4 billion uh, tax increase. Um, I was quite surprised by the results of the poll because every single business I've spoken to says it is the tilt in the threshold in the NIs that is the big change and was the, the shock in the budget that they hadn't planned for. Everybody had factored in the increase in the rate, but the change in the threshold is four times as impactful for the sector as a whole um, as the change in the rate. And that's what's caused the problems. And it's a regressive tax. It hits those on lower wages. So if you're a minimum wage employer, employee in the sector, um, working part time 20 hours, your increase in tax rate for your employer is 75%. If you're a full time at minimum wage, it's about 37%. If you're full time at higher level pay, it's around 7%. So that's the impact. So we're going to see 85% of our businesses say they are going to cut staff hours and jobs. 95% say they are going to increase prices. Um, and 97% say they are cutting investment altogether in order to be able to withstand that. So we're seeing a triple whammy in the in the economy and that means that all the positives that i talked about from the budget that the government thought they delivered to normal consumers who may go out and spend means that you've got the opposite effect and when you look at the analysis the obr analysis and deutsche bank which is is, is a, a worse assessment um you can see the pain coming through in in years one and two post this budget despite the fact that the government say they're not coming back for a second bite at the cherry. You don't get growth going in the economy until year four or five of this parliament. A long time to be bumping along the bottom and a long time to be potentially enduring stagflation. Um, you can see a worsening impact on inflation as you see a, a greater impact on the basket of goods coming through from hospitality price increases as well as retail. You're going to see probably a one to two percentage point worsening in the inflation situation. So instead of being around the two percent mark, it's going to be closer to, to three and a half, four percent for a couple of years longer. And the Bank of England has already said they won't cut rates as fast or as, as far. Um, so you're going to see a quarter to a half percentage point worsening in the in interest rate situation. So uh, it's not, not un unsurprising that consumers are not feeling positive and are not going out and spending. They think that they are going to see a worsening in their situation. And I think that is going to be the big thing that we see that defines hospitality for the next 12 to 18 months. This wall of pain and cost coming through in April, but also a longer term lagging indicator of consumer confidence where consumers don't feel that the, the pound that's in their pocket, the amount of money that they've got can be spent, it needs to be saved because the pain is still going to come. Um, and that's going to continue when you've got more and more commentators saying that the government is going to have to come back uh, for more bites at the cherry. So a second then is, is that kind of age of austerity. I think you know you were looking at uh, again those poll ratings talking about areas that the businesses would like to have seen some money spent we are going to see nothing spent on things like VAT rebates on duty free sales a VAT cut to stimulate demand there just isn't the volume in the public finances to be able to absorb that and manage that uh, <clears throat> and again that feel bad factor of paying more in tax not seeing public sector services improve um, and the higher spending that is going to be continued to be demanded of this government to prove that it can make a difference when it goes through in two critical election years next year 
local elections, but more importantly in 2026, Scottish elections and Welsh elections, there's going to be pressure to be able to demonstrate that this pain has seen a difference. And so I think in, rather than seeing investment in the sector, you are going to see sin taxes and you're going to return to fuel, alcohol, uh, those increases being baked in uh, and, and the pain coming further forward. So I don't think we are going to see any big handouts. And what you saw from Rachel Reeves is that she's very fiscally conservative with a small C chancellor. It's very balancing the books. Cash out here has to be paid for by a tax increase there. And there's nothing that's a free giveaway. So I think from a business point of view, again, you're going to see bigger pain. So the pain of tough choices then is my final point that we're looking at when we're going further forward. Regulation, um, business for as a force for good is likely to be that quid pro quo. It's a very transactional government. Any support that we look to get, you're more likely to see regulation coming through or an ask on regulation. Uh, and I think you can see in some of the early stages of, of this government, we've managed to push back on it quite extensively, uh, but you've got still some very interventionist left leaning, but also far right leaning as well, or on the right wing leaning around nanny state interventionism and Presbyterianism, regulation of food, uh, smoking we saw coming straight back, regulation of alcohol, there's a lot of demands on the government. If you don't have very much money, if you can't do uh, many more tax increases, if you don't have very big, many more big levers at your disposal, uh, there is a tendency for government to, to reach for those uh, big ticket items that look as though they're making a difference and interfering. So I think we are likely to see further interventions in our sector. We've got regulating departments like DHS, uh, Department of Health, and DEFRA dusting down proposals that have been sitting on the blocks for two to three years, packaging taxes, coffee cup taxes, tourism taxes, uh, the, the chief medical officer pressing on uh, minimum alcohol unit pricing, planning restrictions around uh, fast food, uh, high salt, fat, sugar, food, advertising restrictions, all of these issues being talked about. Now, the, the big lever that we've got, of course, is that when you've imposed that level of taxes, on a sector, the Treasury and the, the business department are pushing back quite strongly against um, over intrusive regulation. But it does mean that you are going to see that coming back through in the agenda. And I think we just need to have a big watch out on that. And then the final point um, is, again, it's sort of slightly schizophrenic. The government has this big plan around foreign investment, attracting inward investment, making Britain um, a, a great place to do business, seeing hospitality as part of making Britain a great place to do business. The Prime Minister talked about it as the soft capital that unlocks hard investment. The key bit that's missing, in my view, when, when you look at it across the board of what the government is doing, and again, I have high hopes that they will think again around this uh, because of what they've just done on taxes. One of the big things that makes Britain uh, an attractive place for inward investment is its flexible labour market. And the final area of concern around over-regulation where the jury is still out is the make work pay agenda. If, if a smaller sector is the price for that, for the price for improved productivity, then many in the Labour Party and the Labour government say that is a price worth paying. And that's what we're pushing back against. Uh, but, but equally, there is there is a sort of a tension at the heart of government between the deputy prime minister and the business department about how far you go on labour market regulation and how far does it undermine the government's objectives around growth, 80 percent employment, around inward investment. So there's still a lot of work to go and that there's a lot of detail to be worked through. Most of that will happen in 2025 around zero hours contracts unfair dismissal, day one rights, um, all of those kind of areas. Labour market flexibility, even if we manage it, will impact upon that broader macroeconomic environment and business sentiment and ability to spend. So it's a tension that we're exploiting at the moment post the budget. Uh, we're continuing to push back against those budget measures. We're continuing to ask uh, in advance of the competitive spending review, the comprehensive spending review in the April for some, some investment into the sector around skills, jobs and, and recruitment, as well as innovation and going green. Um, but uh, that big area one then is about that labour market flexibility and maintaining our flexibility to continue to be nimble, agile and to encourage investment. I'm going to pause there because I'm, I'm just about out of time, but hopefully that's given an overview of the areas that we're working on, Chris. That was great, Kate. I mean, it's certainly a lot of content, so thank you for that. Um, 
one quick question for you. I suppose we're talking about short-term pain, which sounds like it's going to last two to three years for growth in 2028, which seems like a long time away. Lack of investments, quite a bleak picture out there. Um, however, can I ask, how does government really, how's the relationship between hospitality and government? One of your great successes has to how you build for a new levels or relationship between the industry and government. How are you seeing that now? Um, I think it's as it's it's as strong as it has been. Um, we've worked really hard with my team over the course of the last 12 to 18 months to, to build relationships with not just the Labour front bench, but, but also the, the special advisors, the policy people who are working now in government to deliver so that they have an understanding of our sector. It doesn't always mean that they don't choose to do the things that we don't like, as we've seen, um, but it is positive. And I think it's really helpful as well. And, and it, it demonstrates the, the close relationship that the Hospitality Sector Council and the Visitor Economy Tourism Council both have been stood back up immediately. Both are working through on co-creating solutions. Both are working on strategies. You don't really have that in other sectors of the economy. So we are a little bit further ahead. Um, and I, I think the government does value, the Chancellor has always talked about the everyday economy. The, the business secretary, Johnny Reynolds, talks about the foundation economy and it's, it's written throughout the industrial strategy. So it's there, as I say, it doesn't mean we get what we want all the time. We just have to keep pushing and campaigning. And that's where we need the, the whole of the industry. It can't just rest on our shoulders to, to have that front door. We can knock the front door down, but we need the whole of the industry to be working with their local MPs to make the case. Great. Kate, thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you very much for your contribution. That's really kind. Um, I ask now, ask Rachel. Hi, Rachel, to join us. Hey, Rachel's Head of Tourism Affairs at Visit Britain, and I'll be interested to see the kind of view that Rachel's got to portray to us. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's always daunting to follow uh, Kate when I'm giving a presentation, so I'm going to have a little bit of a crutch in some slides, and hopefully these will give you some insights into the sector. So, um, as was just introduced, my name is Rachel Farrington and I'm Head of uh, Tourism Affairs at Visit Britain, Visit England. We are the National Tourist Board and we have a statutory duty not only to promote Britain as a tourism destination, but also to support the sector, especially the English local visitor economy um, through the LVEP programme and also provide timely insights and data to the sector. And that's some of the things I'm going to be drawing on today in my presentation. So um, I'm going to focus on some of the insights that we have. Um, I'm choosing a very small section of the sector of the, in the accommodation, but we have insights and data from across the visitor economy sector to, uh, to share as well. And then I'm also going to be talking a little bit about what Visit Britain and Visit England is doing to drive growth, which is, as Kate said, the main mission of this government. Um, so a lot of data on this slide, but um, I wanted to take a zoom out first and look at the tourism sector as a whole. As we can see, inbound and domestic visitors spend billions in the UK. It is a huge sector, and that's something that we're often trying to communicate with uh, government to show the scale of what we can achieve as a, um, as a growth sector. Um, we're all driving towards growth at the moment, and I think we've got a really good story to tell in that we can produce that in-year growth rather than waiting kind of 10, 15 years for a return. You invest in tourism, you can get visitors here within weeks, months, spending in the UK economy. The domestic sector too has huge impact, especially on those more regional destinations that really rely on that spend uh, that's distributed around the country. So I'm going to touch on some consumer insights. Um, we started this particular piece of research during the pandemic and it started off as kind of tracking uh, consumer sentiment around COVID and whether people were looking to take domestic or international breaks. And as we've come out of the COVID pandemic, it's kind of transformed into a piece of work that now really shows us um, what the appetite is for domestic breaks amongst Brits. So this is Brits surveyed um, and we've been tracking it month on month. So there's some good news and bad news. Um, a lot of people still think the worst is still to come. Cost of living crisis is definitely uh, dominating this research now. And we can see that um, a lot of people are still quite pessimistic about the future and think that there's still some difficult times ahead. Um, but we can see that uh, people are wanting to take domestic holidays. Uh, so we can see that uh, about 65% are planning to take um, and uh, took a domestic trip in the last 12 months, about 35% are planning, um, sorry, 35% are also planning um, 
an overseas trip in the next 12 months as well. So the, the appetite to travel is definitely still there. The disappointing uh, stat here is the, the number planning to reduce their number of domestic trips. Um, so 26% overall saying because of the cost of living, they're going to reduce the number of trips they're taking domestically. Now, as I said, I focused on accommodation in the next couple of slides, um, but if you would like to access any of this sentiment data, it is publicly available on our website. So why do people choose domestic trips over international? I think this is a really interesting question. Um, essentially, people find it much easier to plan a domestic trip. They find it easier to book and easier to travel. They find the, uh, that there's less queues and uh, essentially is just an easier and more enjoyable opportunity. And that's a good sign for us. Um, but the things drawing them the other way and going internationally is better weather. And unfortunately, as the tourist board, it's something we wish we could control, but um, it's always gonna be a challenge for us. Other good news is that hotels dominate the kind of preferences for um, domestic visitors they um, hotels have um, always been kind of the top choice for domestic visitors of where they want to stay and that's remained steady throughout this piece of research um, we can see that second down is kind of staying in a rented accommodation like a short-term let um, but the hotel industry is still that kind of favored option for most domestic visitors now this is where it really gets interesting um, the cost of accommodation is seen as the biggest barrier uh, to people taking domestic trips and this is something that has kind of stayed pretty consistent ever since the cost of fuel has kind of started to reduce at the end of 2022 um, and then the cost of accommodate uh, cost of drinking and eating out is a, a solid second so this it gives a lot of kind of context to what Kate was just talking about the cost pressures that are on businesses are also then reflected on the cost pressures that are on consumers and, and we can see that um, those two things are in slight conflict. We know that behaviour change because of those um, cost pressures is also coming through. So 23% saying they're going to choose cheaper accommodation. Um, and that's the challenge for the sector is that uh, consumers are very price aware, they're going to be looking for those deals. And unfortunately, when you have cost pressures on businesses, those are going to be harder to find as well. And um, so that's what you can kind of see the economic um, impact on both sides of the supply and demand side of the sector. Um, but um, we're also seeing some people saying they're going to take a domestic, uh, a day trip rather than an overnight trip as well. And that will, of course, impact the accommodation sector. Moving quickly on to uh, in international visitors. So this is inbound. Uh, just a bit of context before I go on to talking about what Visit Britain, Visit England do. Um, we can see here that preferences for how people book international trips is different in different markets. And um, this is key to our strategy as an organization in terms of driving that demand to Britain, because we have to talk to different parts of the market. So we can see here that in um, Asia, it's mainly, mainly through travel agents and online booking agents that you're booking an entire trip with accommodation included, where in Europe, um, those more kind of local markets, they're more comfortable booking individual pieces of product. So if you're an accommodation provider, if you're looking to appeal to a European market, you can stand alone and be on the kind of booking.com platforms and, and get those bookings directly. Where if you're trying to appeal to that Asian market, you might then look towards kind of travel providers that are putting together packages to get your product to market. Um, and as I said, I'll kind of come back to this in talking about Visit Britain, Visit England strategy uh, for supporting the sector. So um, there is a argument that people will come here anyway. Britain is an incredible destination, is really well known, and we definitely play on that. The reason Visit Britain, Visit England exists is to um, drive both a sense of urgency. Britain is too often seen as a bucket list destination that will be the same whenever you visit it. So we're trying to make sure that people feel that they need to come now and spend money in our economy now. So that's one reason why Visit Britain's activity is required. The other part is about driving that regionality. London naturally dominates uh, the kind of awareness uh, that people have of Britain internationally. So we're here to tell uh, international visitors about the whole of Britain and try and drive them into some of those fantastic destinations that they might not have seen or heard of. We're also um, working to support the sector. Um, Kate has talked about kind of some of the uh, lobbying and things that they're doing as a sector. We're 
also working to both um, represent the sector internally with government. We're part of a government department, so we do a lot of um, intelligence uh, sharing. We share these kind of bits of data that I've shown with you uh, with DCMS. Yeah. We're also uh, working on training programs, which I'll talk you through in a, a second, to make sure that SMEs have that uh, support to internationalize their business, to grow their business, to become more sustainable and accessible too. So as I said, Visit England is the kind of supply side of our organisation that's really supporting uh, the wider sector. We work with local visitor economy partnerships, so that's your kind of Marketing Manchester, Visit Kent organisations to really drive that growth on a local level, so working with them on local growth plans, all the way up to running training courses for SMEs to help them internationalise, make, uh, make it really accessible for them to be able to advertise on those Chinese platforms or um, get, getting new business from the Gulf, those kind of programmes. Um, we've had uh, 400 businesses uh, take part in that training last year, and it's something I think is a really good opportunity, especially for those micro businesses, which make up more than 55% of our sector. And then, of course, the big showcase piece of what Visit Britain and Visit England do is our uh, international campaigns. So we kind of split these into three strands of activity, um, which map onto um, the markets, as I was talking about before. So the first thing is connecting and distributing. So this is about taking the product from Britain and showing it to those international buyers that might be from those online travel agents, or they might be from um, kind of a, a travel bookers, and making sure that they get a really um, great range of product onto their books so that um, consumers from international markets have more choice. So we can see in the picture here, this is a, a, one of our trade missions uh, to Asia where we took international uh, British businesses out to meet those international suppliers on the ground, but we also do it the other way. So we bring uh, international journalists, media buyers, uh, travel buyers to Britain to see the product as well. The central piece is in the Inspire part of our programme, and that's our international marketing campaign. So the things you'll be familiar with seeing in the uh, in the train stations in Europe, um, and I, I'll give you an update on our upcoming campaign shortly. The last thing is conversion. So we know that seeing an advert in a tube station isn't necessarily going to get you to book. It's how do you make that really accessible for visitors? So we work with those household names to make sure that visitors can actually book their trip to Britain. And that's how we drive that conversion um, through from the inspiring, the connecting them to distributors all the way through to those actual bookings. So as I said, we have a new international marketing campaign launching next month. And unfortunately, I can't share it with you yet. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a preview about what we're thinking. So the new film and TV campaign um, starring Great Britain will be launching next month. And it's taking advantage of all the fantastic film and TV productions that we have here in Britain, from Wolf Hall and Bridgerton all the way through to James Bond and Paddington. We want to show that Britain is the real star of the show of these uh, productions. So we'll be using the film and TV hooks uh, to talk about British destinations. It's a really exciting campaign and it's going to be part of a long term platform that we hope to build upon. Um, I've put in my notes that we want to create a blockbuster franchise um, of these kind of campaign points coming out for years to come, because uh, I think there's so many fantastic productions, uh, even in the pipeline that we can build on. And that campaign will be going live in the US, France, Germany, the Gulf and Australia. So those are really high value, high spending markets that we want to drive that urgency from that I talked about earlier and those bookings from across Britain. So we're making sure to um, incorporate destinations from every corner, every nation and region so that we can tell a really holistic story about modern Britain and all of the exciting things there are to do here. So that's our international marketing campaign. I'll end with a, just a couple of pictures to bring this to life because I've talked a lot about theory and our strategies, but this is what it looks like on the ground. So um, up in the top left there, you can see our former campaign, uh, which was spill the tea on GB. That's in the Paris Metro. And you can kind of see there, that's the kind of places that our film and TV campaign will be showing. And then we've also got um, on the right there, some of the trade activity that we do around the world. Um, so having those trade missions, going to those big international trade shows and connecting business with, with buyers. 
And then at the very bottom there, you can also see where we bought those international trade to Britain to see that product on the ground. So I'll end there if I can stop sharing and very happy to take any questions before you move on to the panel. Very sure. Thank you. That's very, very good. Firstly, good luck with the campaign. It's obviously going to be a big thing for next year. What are your aspirations as we go into next year? So, um, as Kate mentioned, we've got a spending review. And of course, the spending review determines the uh, funding of government departments and uh, importantly, us as an arms length body of the government department. So we are going to be trying to show all of this activity that we do in the background, try and show that to politicians, to decision makers, to the Treasury, to show how we are a sector that does drive growth and can deliver on those government missions. So that's our, well, my big ambition for next year. Good luck on that. It sounds like got two big things. But I'm assuming as was it, I think growth, general growth inwards is about six billion up since 2019 in this slide. Yeah, so we're starting that's to a see that, good that message overall, isn't it? Yes, but of course we've had inflation. So um no, that's worry, distorted it ever so slightly as yeah. well. Yeah, I know. I'm still going the right direction, which is the which is the point, isn't it? Yeah. Rachel, look, thank you very much indeed. That was excellent. And I wish you well for next year. It sounds like a big year coming up. And now I have the pleasure to invite Russell to come and join me. Good morning. Good morning. Well, good luck with the panel. Got, yeah, I, I noticed there was one question um, from one of our audience uh, asking, you know, why was Rachel focusing on England uh, and not Wales, Scotland and Northern <laughs> Ireland? Uh, and just to answer that, uh, Rachel, I don't know whether you're still there, but um, I believe that the uh, that the answer is because that's your brief. Um, your yes. visit Britain and England uh, specifically, and someone else takes care of the the rest of the British Isles. Yes. So just to explain very quickly, so tourism is a devolved um, uh, competency. So visit Wales and visit Scotland are managed by the respective Scottish and Welsh governments, but we market Britain as a whole internationally, and then domestically we focus on England. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Kate. And please, can I invite my distinguished panelists to uh, put themselves on screen, turn on their microphones and cameras? Um, Peter, Puneet, Ed, James, Graham and Emma, we're all here. Um, they're going to ensure that all our questions uh, get answered, both the ones that I've prepared uh, and, of course, uh, distinguished audience members, yours. So please use the Q&A button to write in any questions that you may have uh, during the course of our session. And as Chris said at the beginning, if we aren't able to answer it live um, during the session, uh, we'll get back to you with a written answer. OK, um, we have about 45 minutes and little more. So let's get on with it. I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves in two sentences, okay? Count them as they go along. First sentence is your name, your company, and your role within your company. And then secondly, uh, in the second sentence, your biggest concern, only one, uh, for the UK hospitality sector uh, emanating from recent governmental initiatives. So just one, very quickly, uh, and I'm gonna look at my screen as I do this. I'm gonna start with Ed, because you're at the top of my screen. Hello everyone, um, I'm Ed O'Dell, <clears throat> one of the directors at um, Flint Global, which is a um, business advisory helping companies with regulatory and policy um, challenges, um, so we're sort of made up largely of sort of ex-civil servants, ex-politicians and so on. Um, my own background is as a, a reformed treasury official, and so I sort of come here today from the perspective of um, the sort of economic policy and specifically in my case sort of tax policy uh, issues. Um, and I suppose that would be my sort of main concern here, which is uh, actually for the sector that um, in the tax policy and perhaps maybe more broadly in the sort of uh, industrial strategy space, the government hasn't got a sort of coherent view um, and nor does it sort of approach a lot of its policy thinking, I think, as we've seen at the budget in this holistic way across the piece. So my concern is death by a um, a thousand cuts, so to speak, um, uh, particularly in the sort of tax base without anyone really having stacked up what individual measures mean for the hospitality sector. 
Thanks, Ed. Can I remind everybody that there are two sentences available? Um, <laughs> and I think, Ed, you... I used, uh, I used you, a lot you of set, colon. You set the wrong different. example. So, James, uh, you're next. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm James Sorford. I'm a partner in the Bird and Bird Hotels team. I guess the big concern is, obviously, we're imposing a lot of cost on business. Are we actually going to see the growth that government's saying they are trying to achieve? Thank you. Emma? Uh, Emma Young, I'm a head of syndication finance at AOB. I think one of my concerns is um, linked a little bit to growth and um, the impact of the tax, the impact of all these costs. How does that leave the investor in the UK? Brilliant. Thanks very much. Graham? Yeah, so uh, Graham Smith from, from Alex Partners. Uh, so I specialise in providing corporate finance and restructuring advice uh, in the travel, hospitality and leisure industry. Um, I think my biggest concern, so what my clients talk to me about, um, is mostly that in increase in the cost of employing people, and in particular, uh, the cost of employing uh, part-time and relatively low-paid people, which is obviously a, um, a large part of the uh, hospitality employment base. Thank you so much. Uh, Peter, Peter Anscombe. Hello, Luke. Um, Peter Anscombe. Um... Edwardian Hotels London. I'm the senior corporate director there. Um, I, I think really in terms of for the, for the businesses to avoid hurt, the, the, the thing that we ultimately rely on is the elasticity of demand in terms of the ability of the consumer to continue to pick up the cost increases. Um, the question is how long one can rely on that and, and what the ultimate impact will be on the businesses. Thank you. And last but now, by no means least, Puneet. Hi, I'm Puneet Kanuga, CIO at EQ Hotels. Um, so I think I think it, it is it is what all the other panelists have said. I think tax policy is front and center. I think part of that's what's passed now with the national insurance changes. And then the other big concern is what's happening happening with business rates and where that's going to go in the next couple of years. Okay, so that's by way of introduction. Let's get into the meat. Uh, we'll we'll start big uh, macro and 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 then uh, uh, start to sort of drill down into some of the issues. Um, but guys and gal, what is your summary view? Okay, so listening to Kate uh, and and knowing what you do, um, I just like you to to put into your words uh, the economic and fiscal picture post-budget, how Labour is approaching its strategy uh, from uh, both an economic and political perspective. Now, we don't normally put, a, put experts like you um, into such a role to, ask, uh, to answer questions like that, but I'd just like you to give us and your audience today um, what you feel that the impact is going to be on the hospitality sector. And because I'm a male chauvinist pig, I'm going to go for Emma first. Thank you, Russell. Um, look, I think there's been a reasonable degree of negativity around this budget, particularly from those that I've spoken to in the business community. You know, the national insurance combined at minimum wage disproportionately does impact a labour intensive sector such as hospitality. Um, but that said, you know, from a lender's perspective, we've seen this industry, you know, take on some significant headwinds and challenges, as has been mentioned by other speakers today over the past eight years. So, you know, I'm reasonably optimistic and I don't think it would be unreasonable to assume that some of that cost, yes, it will be painful up front, but there's operators out there that we believe will successfully be able to pass some of that on. But what I've actually seen and the real talking point um, since the budget um, in those owners and borrowers that I've spoken to is around the inheritance tax changes. So many large UK hotel companies, family owned, generational, employing, you know, thousands of people face this significant increase. And only last week I was speaking to an owner who indicated they have effectively paused all investment activity in the UK. They won't be making any acquisitions until they really understand the impact of the, um, the tax increase there. Um, and effectively, what came out of that conversation is their options appear to be quite limited. Pushing companies offshore has other impacts on the economy. So I would have to say, you know, my view is there's a bit of a dampened business sentiment out there. It's too early to say how that will obviously translate. 
Um, in summary, I think the budget net negative for the hospitality sector. Ed, what's your view? Um, well, maybe I'll give sort of the political macro view, which is my, my view is that um, Labour's only route to winning the next election, actually, they've hemmed themselves in pretty quickly. Their only real route to it is above trend economic growth and above trend tax receipts that stem from that. Um, and I think we're going to see a greater focus over the next year or so on Labour's core economic mission. They've been very focused on sort of um, the fiscal situation, but actually they need that. And really the question I think for the sector is, you know, how do you make a case to government about your critical role in helping to deliver that growth when clearly their sort of predisposition is to look at other so-called growth driving sectors, you know, that have typically been sort of higher productivity in the past. What is the pitch there? Because I think unless the hospitality sector can place itself at the centre of that economic debate, then, you know, you're largely lumped in as almost social policy. This is about, you know, ensuring that high streets are vibrant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that really is sort of a key question. I, you know, I, I've got to say, I don't have an, an answer for that, but that that feels to me like um, sort of playing into the government's sort of real political priorities is the is the way to go. OK, thank you. James? Um, I mean, obviously, a number of people have touched on the panel in terms of the, the impact of the tax. I think there's a couple of things it's also worth sort of expanding on. Obviously, the first one is one of the outcomes of the budget was to see, see a real rise in swap rates, which obviously filters through both to hotel owners who are funding the hotels, they'll be paying more interest, but it also fun, filters through to consumers. So I think it, it has an impact in terms of the wider macroeconomic, in terms of the pe cash people have in their pocket. I think the other thing from a sector point of view that's worth thinking about is, yes, obviously, we've talked about the negative on the sector. One of the things is that it is not a flat line application across the sectors. Some types of hotels will be far more severely impacted than others. So, and I'm talking not just about the budget, I'm talking about the government's policy on things like environmental and energy costs. You know, if you look at big country house hotels with golf courses, they employ a lot of people, they tend to be environmentally, um, you know, not, not sort of uh, uh, well built from the point of view of con conserving heat, they're going to have far higher energy bills and, and labour costs than some other sectors. And interesting, those sort of spa um, golf course type hotels typically have the lowest profitability of, of all the hotels in the sector. So you compare, for example, typically they're running profitably about 24% compared to say 40% for extended sector. So, I think if you look at the macroeconomic point, obviously it's going to impact the hotel sector. But I think also we should perhaps talk about on the panel isn't just going to impact the sector, it will impact some bits of our sector far more than others. Thank you. Puneet? Yeah, I think I think the impact or so it kind of puts up putting some numbers to this now. So if you look at kind of hotels in the UK, we think the impact of the national insurance on its own would be about three to four percent of total payroll. If you then layer on the, the the kind of national living wage change as well, you're looking at a 10% pop in payroll uh, or thereabouts over the course of next year. Um, you know, we think even with some efficiencies baked in, you'll probably need to increase your top line by five to seven percent to mitigate for that. And if you kind of look at where you know inflation has tapered down now. So if you look at where the economy is, you know, maybe in London, maybe in Edinburgh, you can get that kind of growth you'll struggle to get that in many regional markets. So I think, you know, to, to, to what other people are saying, it is, it is, it's not going to impact everyone in the same way. There'll be a disproportionate impact, I think, on smaller hotels, I think on regional hotels. And uh, I, I just don't see that kind of, you know, high single-digit growth coming through many of the regional markets this year. Peter, what's your view? I think in the same way a number of people have said, ultimately there'll be a question of how much, and as I was saying earlier, how much cost can actually be passed on. Um, I mean, clearly both hospitality businesses, but also much of our client base through whether we're looking at the operational costs or whether we're looking at the um, cost of living positions, um, they're going to feel the pain in the bottom line or in their pockets for, for the short to medium term. I mean, how long that will prove to be is going to be a question of of whether uh, in, in terms of real growth strategy or whether we're more in a position of sort of act and hope. Um, I think it's hard to have confidence at the moment that there is a real thought out strategy. Uh, I'm not a political analyst, probably more of a political sceptic. 
but I know recently a guy who's a professor, pro, um, political political economist, newspaper columnist, previously was a supporter of the left, wrote that this government is very obviously failing and Rachel Reeves is a very big threat to the well-being of this country. Um, at the moment, I don't think I have any reason to disagree with him. <laughs> and last but not least, Graham. Um, so I think so, some of the, the challenges certainly um, our clients are talking about is um, in some ways we, we're going to know the bad news that's come out from this um, latest budget in terms of you know, these will be you know, the increases in, uh, in tax um, reduction in the relief on things like uh, on rates. Um, what we don't yet know is um, how the consumer might respond when we're seeing increases in the national minimum wage and some of the knock-on impacts that will have and people um, you know above that level but who want to maintain their differential uh, in pay uh, so ends up with you know more money in people's pockets so how you know how will the consumer react to that and you know will that uh, enable some of these price increases to be absorbed because you know I think I would agree you know absent those increases in people's pay um, it, it feels as though across lots of aspects of the of the hospitality and also retail and consumer sector um, that the price rise trend has sort of gone as far as it can uh, before you start impacting you know demand and volumes um, but you know, we will have people's pay packets increasing, you know, in the immediate month after this being um, implemented. So we sort of know the downside. What we don't know yet is what might be the positive custom consumer impact of this. And that's what I always love, a glass half full. Thank you. Um, just before I move on to my next question, uh, one of our distinguished audience has raised her hand. Um, I assume that that's because uh, you wish to ask a question but I'm going to ask you to write it into the Q&A button uh, if, uh, if you wouldn't mind, please, so that we can uh, deal with it properly. Um, we, despite Graham's sort of slight note of optimism around the corner, um, cost increases are nevertheless still being mooted, uh, and one of which is a tourist tax, which uh, people are continuing to, to, to talk about. Um, would this be uh, a good or a bad initiative for the UK? Places like Edinburgh have been mooted already. Um, so, um, Peter, you, you were talking about cost increases uh, and you have no hotels in Edinburgh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, no. Certainly, certainly London would be uh, quite an impact. I, I mean, I think that's right. Any... Any new tax on top of the necessary increases in ADR that are going to be necessary to fund the operational cost increases of the businesses, etc., is bound to have some impact on demand. Uh, I think if one can have confidence that the funds can be demonstrated as going towards definitive business to the sector, um, whether that's uh, in, in, in the forms of the various marketing bodies, training, subsidies, whatever, if, if it actually delivers real benefit back in, then, then perhaps one could rethink the position. But personally, I'm not convinced that you could would trust this government or indeed any government to deliver on the fact that the full benefit can come back. I think like most things, um, the tax will go into a wider pot so that will fund the things that they put down as their priorities um, and the benefit back into the sector, I would guess, could be quite minimal. And therefore, on balance, yes, it would be a, a big negative. Anybody got a different view? Puneet? I, I, I do not have a different view. Okay, all <laughs> in violent agreement. Any, anybody want to challenge the, uh, the, the very erudite way that Peter's answered that question? I mean, also not, not, not to challenge it, but uh, obviously the, the tourist numbers in the UK are, 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 have been down since 2019. So I think 2019 we had 40.9 million visitors to the UK. This year we're protected at 38.7. So, so we haven't really recovered. There's, there's been a report come out recently that suggests we've fallen behind other European countries. One of the reasons for that, uh, and there are various reasons for it, including the difficulty of getting in, 
is just how uncompetitive we are on cost. So I think the um, World Economic Forum ranks us 113th out of 119 in terms of price competitiveness for tourism. So the UK as, a, as an expensive place to come on holiday, putting yet more cost into that is not going to help that equation. I, I think there's a, there's a good example of what happened in Amsterdam this year, where they actually took the tourist tax from 7% to 12.5%. And that led to uh, Amsterdam having a pretty, Amsterdam actually going backwards in terms of ADR this year, uh, compared to London, Edinburgh, Paris, which kind of went, went upwards. So in the end, if they put taxes, it's just going to have to be absorbed by hoteliers, uh, because to, to, to what everyone is saying here, the elasticity of demand will just be, just be stretched so much. I just don't know how much more you can stretch out at this stage. Graham, you were wanting to come in earlier. Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily a different view, but um, it, given everything that, you know, Kate said earlier, um, it, I mean, it seems like a very natural place for the government to look um, in terms of uh, just the positioning of what, how this tax may be viewed. Um, then, you know, when you have, uh, when you have an attractive country to visit from overseas tourists something that can be presented as you know uh not on the face of it being born by um you know sort of the, the the residents of the country i think politically that can play quite well i think also you know uh, the amsterdam example um you know is one side of it but i'm sure there are side lots of other research which says it's mixed at best as to you know what is the impact on actual visitor numbers um so i think you know whether you know people are, are, agree with it or or disagree with it um it does feel like one of those things which is um you know in the more likely bucket than less likely given the current environment okay emma rolf add anything to add well, I, i've got um I mean, my, my perspective is that as a sort of ex treasury official is that the sort of government approach to policy in this area doesn't it doesn't really fit the a lot of the sort of way that things are thought about is in terms of like domestic policy and displacement and you know actually if you incentivize this bit you're just moving this bit from there to there on the sort of VAT sort of tax free shopping space actually the point here is almost you know, there is a section of tourists that you can either have or not have, you know, and they can visit your country or not. And there is a set of price sensitive, you know, they will go to Paris, they want to do shopping, they will buy a lot, you know, it's a big attraction for them. And I don't know that that sort of economic case has ever been really fully worked through um, with government. And and the sort of final point there is to say the government's approach to costing things is very static. It says, well, look, if you if if we did this, it will cost a billion, I think was the, the estimate. But they never really ran through. But what, what does it mean in terms of tax take in other parts, you know, in terms of hotel VAT, for example, or restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, because no tourist comes and just buys things and leaves. So I don't know that that argument has ever been fully run through. I think there might be a little bit of political space to say, you know, the Tories got this wrong um, and there's an economic argument here that you're missing. But at the moment, the government, I would say, is so focused on sort of hair shirt. I don't know now necessarily is the right moment, but hopefully, you know, as we get into the spending review and the period afterwards and the economic growth sort of focus returns, there may well be a moment where trying to make that case is actually sort of a realistic prospect. OK. Um, just before we move on, one of our audiences uh, has commented, basically, um, every, everywhere else in Europe is doing it, and it's only a matter of when, not if. So, um, um, and on that bright note, uh, I shall move on to uh, another question. Um, I know we're going to focus on staff quite a lot in this conversation, because uh, that's where most of our audience, when they answered the poll, um, most of you, I'm sure, uh, feel that the most of the, the, the majority of impact is going to be uh, following changes to the national minimum wage to employer NIC rates and thresholds and so forth. So um, do you really think that hoteliers are going to be taking the sort of horrible ac actions 
that we would prefer that they shouldn't? Um, are people going to reduce the number of people that they employ? Can they afford to do that and maintain standards? Are they going to just stop hiring people? Uh, are they going to try and increase price? What, what, what do you think they're going to do? Graham? Um, I, I mean, I think that it's whenever you have a situation that increases the the cost of something in the way that um, the budget has changed the cost of employing relatively low paid flexible workers, it undoubtedly causes business owners and managers to to revisit their assumptions on how they uh, use that particular um, you know, part of their business. So uh, I think you know, the point that Jane's made around this impacting different parts of the hotel industry in different ways is undoubtedly true. Um, you know, the, there's already been a, a big push towards um, more of that limited service uh, offer as part of the hotel market. I think, you know, uh, even before this, um, you know, the UK was moving towards more of a, a higher cost of labour environment, um, which was causing hotel business models to shift to align with that. Um, even if you go beyond limited service, then um, using technology to push more of the actions onto the guest and away from hotel staff. Um, you know, I think those uh, price inflation, certainly in the luxury market that requires um, a certain level of staffing to meet uh, you know, the demands of your guest, um, you know, I think seems highly likely i think it 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 certainly makes things tougher in that full service mid market space where i think that the consumer's ability to absorb um higher rates um is probably more challenging than in the luxury end um and also i think one of the things that um we may see from this is the as the flexibility of hiring workers and some of the other regulation that's coming in in relation to that, um, what it might cause is hoteliers to be a little bit more cautious around taking on temporary workers to deal with those surge demand periods. Um, and that could cause um, a clipping of, of revenues. Uh, you're not able to take the biggest advantage of those surge revenue periods, but also um you know potentially an increase in customer complaints when hoteliers don't have enough staff on because they've been more cautious um and um you know could have impacts on those net promoter scores that people watch very closely and uh, online reviews so um yeah i think there's a lot to unpack here for for operators and i think everybody is revisiting you know their models to see what they can do sure so just focusing on a little bit of what uh, Graham was saying, uh, James, has the reduction in the number of uh, European or European Union workers post-Brexit led to a significant staffing gap in our sector? I, mean, I think the whole sector is, is what we've discussed all the time, that it's finding the right people. I mean, it's all we'll talk about our, our employers uh, are going to employ fewer staff. I, you know, most most hotel owners I talk to are struggling to find enough people to to employ anyway. And Peter may have a view on this because obviously you, you you're involved in it day to day. But I think that is a reality. Yet, yes, we may get staff numbers reduced ultimately, but 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 I think well, there is still that shortage, notwithstanding, um, you know, the job 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 numbers coming down recently. So I, so I think that is a challenge. I, I agree with Graham's point. I think I think we will see technology. People will now, in many ways, these sort of make, making it more difficult, more expensive to employ people. I think people will start to look at technology. We've talked about it for a long time. We haven't seen it come through. You know, will we see AI dealing with your concierge service, your front of house? Um, I was served my my meal in, in the Berlin Hotel Conference last night at the reception of my hotel, my little robot that bought it to me. You know, I think people have to start looking at these 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 innovations and go, well, is that is that the way to go forward in terms of driving driving um down employee costs if they are going to go up? Emma, are you finding with the people that you're talking to that are interested in presumably borrowing money from you, um 
is the attractiveness of the UK hospitality industry from an investment perspective, is that being adversely affected? Or to what extent are you finding that people are, are sort of looking beyond uh, the measures that have been announced? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, in the, as, as I mentioned, some of the <clears throat> borrowers and owners that I've been speaking to, that, that wasn't actually their principal concern. They were concerned about other parts of the budget. But clearly, it is a concern and it is a cost that needs to be baked in. And I think when it comes to, you know, the areas of the market that we're interested in funding and where we've got experience and where we've had good experience, um, it comes down to location, location, location. And, you know, who is managing these hotels and to a degree the lender will look to that management team to understand their strategies for dealing with this cost increase whether it be you know as i've mentioned top line or in other ways and to james's point you know how much of this you know can be taken away through technology we need to talk to the people who know what they're doing and that's the management at the end of the day it hasn't deterred us as a lender in the market in fact we've made a very stated play both in the uk and the republic that we want to deploy our balance sheet to this sector but it will be in segments of the sector that we're comfortable in and management teams that get us comfortable that these costs aren't going to adversely affect um, their profit margins to a point that it would impact on the debt stack. This in, kind of goes back to how we're structuring these loans. And post-COVID, there is most definitely more flexibility in terms of lender and borrower and how those conversations are going. So I think everything boils down to, you know, getting a really good understanding of the business model, the segment, the management, and then making sure that the appropriate debt profile is put in place. Interesting. Peter, um, I think it was James was uh, giving you a shout out in terms of uh, uh, being witness to the costs of employment rising uh, because of the sheer numbers that you, you're employing in London alone. Um, was there any particular aspect of, of what he was saying uh, that you felt resonated particularly in your business? Um, no, it probably cuts across a number of the parts of the conversation we either have had or will have. Um, I mean, clearly, I, I should think on on average, where uh, the, the changes in the budget put a between one and one and a half million cost onto um, each one of the operational properties, the the larger ones in London. Um, from that point of view, that is either. I mean, you've got a limited number of choices. You're either talking about something in terms of recovery through increased ADR, you're looking at the possibility of reduced workforce, or you're looking to find other efficiencies in the business, or you're resigning yourself to less profit. And there aren't really many other um, possibilities. From, from our point of view, as full service properties, as luxury properties in London, there is a base level that, that you have to achieve in terms of the services that you're providing. Um, I think going back, you know, the comment was made relative to new technologies or whatever. Yes, in certain parts of the business that exists. Um, technologies in terms of the actual um, things like housekeeping or F&B delivery, uh, in terms of which is really one of the more um, experience based things within the hotel. Um, anything that's more IT delivered uh, is detrimental to the concept of service within a luxury property. So. I think it's hard to see that. Um, yes, the difference in terms of uh, um, employment from European countries or whatever, the possibility of greater movement of younger people, you end up in this balance between um, what you actually need from a staffing point of view and the balance on taking people in for relatively short periods in terms of the cost of training them and giving them the experience in something that's a very um, transitional market anyway and you've got a certain amount of, of sort of throughput um so thank you yeah, yeah. okay uh Pani, i was intrigued you were saying already um by how much your your costs are going to be rising and not necessarily all mm -hmm. able to be recovered through rate increases and so forth um how might hotel values be affected as a result um uh, as a result of all this so I think I think picking I up. I think you know something about hotel values from your previous yeah. life. So, so do you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So I think I think just picking up on what Peter just said. So if you have a a million pound impact uh, on profitability in a central London hotel, that's roughly eighteen to twenty million of value taken off in 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 one go, and and that's just simple maths. And and you know obviously in in a market like London where you have more levers to pull and you might find that demand is a bit more elastic, you might be able to push that across to the guests and 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 then recover in that way. But I think with all of these changes, whether it's NI, whether it's uh, business rates or whatever's happening in, in terms on a, the labor market, all of these are incremental. And then to, to I think Ed summarized it really well at the beginning when he said it can't be a death by a thousand cuts. It's all kind of accretive and incremental. And if it just kind of keeps sneaking up on us that, you know, values will be impacted. You know, for our part, what we're doing in our hotels is mainly kind of that, that, that sort of making businesses more efficient at the moment. We having to lean and then do things like, um, you know, offer guests drinks vouchers to skip housekeeping, for example, or or look at the hours we open on the bank holiday in certain restaurants and F and B outlets because you're paying twice as much in terms of payroll on those days. So I think you're having to be very clever. Our sector is naturally quite creative, and we've demonstrated that. But but it 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 has been quite a lot of uh, regulatory pressure piling up on us, which will have a valuation impact over time. Okay. Just um, on that, um, yeah. Russell, uh, just a, a sort of counter um, sort of our, you know, challenge, let's say, we've seen a significant amount of investment, a lot of portfolio deals and that kind of stuff being done more recently. And we keep hearing that there is a lot more capital to invest, taking aside the, 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 the um, inheritance tax issue that might affect a cohort. Isn't there still that sort of general sentiment that people want to buy assets in the UK and maybe to your point you know, they particularly like London or Edinburgh but there seems to be still a lot of inbound investment um from from certain let's say private equity or or private office yeah I think I think there's there's a lot of interest in the UK and look in, in a way kind of what we are not talking about here is what's happening elsewhere in Europe and are we are we just at least you know compared to compared to some other markets we still not as heavily regulated uh, our, our kind of labor market is still flexible. So I think, you know, there will be interest in the UK. The question is, you know, what the pricing will be, where, where valuations are going to sit. Uh, private equity is smart capital. Uh, they're looking at deploying on a global basis. So I think, and, and, and they can move very quickly. So I think at the moment, because of everything that's happening in the US, because of, you know, the Euro Europe just being a more heavily regulated market, there is a lot of interest in the UK. I think what we saw this year was maybe more of a culmination of deals that were in the in the making for for a couple of years as opposed to everything being engineered this year uh but kind of you know we, we we're operating partners we work a lot with private equity and and the uk is definitely kind of up there in terms of desirability but we are also seeing a lot of investors now looking at the south of Europe, for example because those economies are are growing very well and they are now perceived to be more kind of business friendly jurisdictions Thanks. Ed, I want to conclude this little section of questioning with you just to uh, use the breadth of your experience and taking into account what Kate was saying at the beginning of uh, of our session, where she didn't feel that the government really had uh, the intention of uh, adding insult to injury. Uh, but what pressure do you think that the hospitality sector in general uh, could or should bring to bear on the government? Uh, perhaps to dissuade them from thinking about making even further increases to employers and I and so forth, because this has already been mooted in spite of what Kate was saying. Yeah, my, I mean, my observation is that it was very starkly obvious in the materials that produced alongside the budget that they had not thought about the national living wage change and the employment exchange together in a combined effect. And in fact, um, if you do so, I think it probably leads you down a different policy route. So I think the challenge for the industry now is to some extent, maybe to like plug that evidence gap, which I think we've had some conversation about, you know, what is the real world impacts here? And, and what's realistic in terms of sort of future asks of government, which is to think very carefully around the sort of future national living wage changes um, and sort of coming back and sort of looking at these um, uh, sort of broad, uh, I guess, property intensive 
um, high employment sectors, low margins are not the obvious candidate to come to every time you need sort of a, a new source of, of income. So to think carefully in future. And then the live area of policy debate really is in the business rate space where the government is looking at some fairly fundamental reforms. But what it's put on the table is not a one way bet for the so called so, you know, high street businesses that they are trying to target. In fact, like for a lot of businesses, you know, it's giving with one hand and taking with the other. And I think there's a reasonable conversation and a little bit of political space at the moment to say to government, mm -hmm. look, like you hit us too hard in a slightly ill thought out way. And this business rates process, we need to get to the end of this with a material improvement in the in the position here. Um, and, and that does mean sort of redistributing away from hospitality, retail and, and so on not least with the sort of current reliefs and so on falling away. That for me, feels like a realistic policy discussion. But yes, I, I do genuinely think that, the, that there was just no real thought given to what the package as a whole meant for sectors like hospitality at budget. Okay, I'm going to move on to a, a, a different topic, if you don't mind. Um, let's talk about um, Airbnb just briefly, because... Uh, um, I, I suspect that that becomes a, an issue that is certainly at the forefront of of, of a number of our panel uh, where they're operating hotels in competition with Airbnb. So in other countries, you know, we've seen a clampdown on Airbnb and short stay rentals, uh, and that might prove to be a positive move for hotel room rates, but potentially it might deter visitors uh, overall, which, of course, might be the plan. Um, so what advice do you have, panel, uh, for the UK government in dealing with Airbnb and the like? Um, uh, Puneet. Yeah, so look, I mean, I, 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 as a family, we use Airbnb quite a bit. Um, you know, we think it's incredibly convenient, especially when you have kids and, and so on. Uh, that said, I, I do think there needs to be a level playing field. So I think if, if hoteliers are facing regulations, if they are facing licensing needs, FLS audits and health and safety and so on, I do think that needs to be be also applied to Airbnb and other, other kind of short lets. And then I think there's a wider question, maybe away from our kind of core competence about what Airbnb is doing to residential markets in key cities in, in the UK. I think there is a housing shortage and there's kind of no discussion about it. So there needs to be some kind of discussion about capping how many room nights properties can be used for Airbnb and also some consideration to planning considerations, but also to what it means for people living in those buildings. Okay. Emma, do you have a view? Are you a consumer? Uh, I am a consumer, probably less so than uh, maybe a few years ago. Uh, you have a couple of bad experiences and <laughs> you get a little bit scarred. But I think the biggest you know, factor for me with my lending hat on is around that regulatory piece and you know, that firelight and safety and all that kind of stuff and reputational risk that goes with it. So from a sort of lending side of things, it's just a little bit um, of an unknown and something that we would really only factor in when looking at competitor sets, not something we would be funding. Interesting. Peter? <clears throat> um, yeah, certainly agree with the point relative to uh, the, the control side relative to the safety and, and general overseeing of the, of the nature of properties, etc. Um, yes, it's happened in all sorts of other countries. I, personally, I think there's a balance. I can understand more the idea of limiting the number um, I, for a property to be licensed to be able to put out on short-term rental, I don't think I disagree. I've seen it in enough other places where they limit the ability to take on numbers of rentals. At the point where you allow something to be short-term rented, but then make it so that the number of rentals that you can take in don't make it economically possible to do and in most countries they've also put a situation where on sale you can't pass on that license that you actually end up destroying part of the underlying real estate market as well i know that's not what we're talking about here but i think the thing is that on so many things the the government thinkings don't necessarily look at the consequential elements rather than what they perceive as the initial face value 
Okay. Right. Right. There's, there's, a, there's a challenge here as well. A lot of the government legislation has been brought in UK, but 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 across Europe has been a very blunt instrument. And what it has done is is it's restricted the professional service department operators who are offering a genuine professional service for people who want it. Um, obviously, it, it's trying to tackle a the, the housing shortage, which we've, we've talked about in the antisocial behaviour. But but it has been very blunt, and I think going forward, if there's any bit of advice the government, it's got to be that those apart hotel service department operators who are who are really starting to come to the fore we're seeing real growth in that sector and, and obviously it's a very profitable sector they need to make sure that in bringing in the legislation it does not obstruct that because at the moment that is exactly what's happening a lot of those operators are simply saying we simply can't go into that jurisdiction because the restriction doesn't let us let for more than 90 days it just doesn't work um, which is the case in london there are very similar restrictions elsewhere so uh, a lot of jurisdictions are simply the service top apartment operators are simply not going in there because they can't make it work so that probably is the biggest challenge particularly for that sector from from our sector's impact point of view okay graham yeah i think um it would you can definitely see the attraction from a, a governmental perspective on um, trying to, to clamp down or reduce the number of properties that are, uh, are used for this short term rental market, given that they are trying to address a, a housing supply issue and um, you know, all of the challenges that come from trying to increase that supply through, through building new homes. It takes an awful long time. Um, so you can certainly see the attraction to them of uh, trying to release more supply through uh, shifting use. Um, yeah, I think the the comment James makes around the blunt instrument, um, you know, I think it's it's very hard for a, a government to to keep pace with something which has been a huge technological innovation in the the rise of Airbnb that probably started with you know quite a neat idea of how to you know, raise a little bit of extra income from your, your spare room and has, you know, ballooned into a massive supplier of um, of accommodation across the globe. Uh, so there's an element of catch up being played here. Um, yeah, the, the overall mood music, though, can only be positive for, for hoteliers um, because, you know, it seems as though this would be a, a high point in the supply of this type of accommodation, certainly in the in the major cities, um, which can be beneficial from the rates for you know hoteliers who are you know been there for a long established times have all the the, the regulations etc. Um, so um, so yes, I I can imagine possibly some lobbying uh, around the the overall societal benefits of reducing Airbnb may be happening from the uh, from the hoteliers of the world. Uh Okay, thanks. And then finally, on this topic, Ed, um, you know, could could we encourage there to be tighter regulations on alternative accommodation providers um, to uh, level the playing field, perhaps? Do you know, Russell, that was exactly the point I was going to make, which is uh, from the sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of the best way to describe it, the professional or the formal hospitality sector perspective, I would just be wanting to make sure that on the regulatory and on the tax base, actually, that there is that level playing field and that, you know, if you are a local hotel, you are competing with the local Airbnb market, sort of in at least in a fair, in a fair and sort of uh, level way, which I don't think has necessarily been the, the case to date. And my sort of concern would be uh, not inadvertently sort of eroding out um, that sort of uh, hotel and local hospitality sector um by not having taken a considered view of what a level playing field should should really look like in that in that sector okay um sadly we're running out of time um I, i'm just going to make an observation that one of our audience has made that in her part of the world in brighton uh, there are four thousand listings which makes it impossible for hospitality staff to find a home near where they work which is essential for shift workers so we should all bear that in mind um, I had alerted the panel to a final question, but actually um, I'm going to change my mind uh, and bring in the question that um, unfortunately an anonymous attendee has uh, has raised. And I want a simple yes or no or can't think answer. Um, so all being said, 
Last question. Do you expect the ADR, rev par and values to rise in the next couple of years? Or are we looking at a period of stagnation until cost increases are baked in and the dust settles? Ladies first again, Emma. Um, I think it depends on the segment of the market. I think initially, probably no, but over time, yes. Ed? Ditto. Oh, gosh. Everybody in violent agreement. James? Uh, I mean, I guess we, we look at ADR rises, but you've got to take into account inflation. We had a very strong 2023. I, I think we may see really struggle to see room rates keeping up ahead of going, certainly going ahead of inflation. So uh, yes, but only really to keep pace with inflation. OK, yes, but Graham. Uh, yeah, I think we'll see an increase now in, in transactions. And I think people will be pleasantly surprised at the values on those transactions. Good. Peter. Um, I think, I mean, there's already pressure on ADR. So I, I think I agree that ADR will be relatively flat in real terms in terms of the valuation side. Um, it comes back to your earlier valuation question. I mean, we went through a period of interest rates over 5% and valuers found reasons to use cap rates that were below the prevailing rates and didn't really reduce the values that much. The question now will be in terms of, of how much of the current cost increases can be offset and how much will actually go into the valuation calculation. And finally, Puneet, and sorry, just one sentence. I agree with PJ and Emma. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to hand over uh, to Karen. I want to thank the panel um, for the way that they've approached this. And Karen, I'm sorry I've left you zero time to close the session. But thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Russell. Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Freeb. I'm head of Bird and Birds International Hotels, Hospitality and Leisure team. Well, we've just had some fascinating insights from our experts into the impact of the budget on our sector as we move into 2025. We're certainly facing some challenges. Our panelists and speakers covered a large range of topics, but all of them were querying, where does growth come from in the light of the fact that government is imposing more and more costs on businesses? Ed considered whether there would be a redistribution of investment away from the hospitality sector in favour of other sectors. Emma emphasised the importance at this time to investors of a strong management team to give banks the confidence in their financial competence. Staffing is forever an issue. There's still a shortage of people despite job numbers coming down. This led James Salford to question whether we were actually going to see the long awaited tech revolution predicted for the hospitality sector come to fruition. One of Ed's key points was, with no real coherent government policy, are we in the hospitality sector facing death by a thousand cuts? And he felt that the sector wouldn't really be able to see which way uh, it was going and to get greater clarity on the government's plans for growth until, as he put it, the government shrugged off its hair shirt. So thank you to our wonderful panelists and speakers. Thank you for joining our 21st webinar. And we look forward to you joining us in 2025. Our webinars for next year are already in the planning stage. And meanwhile, on behalf of Bird and Bird, HBS, EP Business in Hospitality and Alex Partners, I wish you all the compliments of the season and a very happy and prosperous 2025.